presidents, and we'll see what else we get in. So, is, I believe, where you left off, and I believe this is where Mr. Herman wants you to start writing. The rest of it, I believe, is background. So, let's do that. Is this easy to operate at all? I have no idea how to work it. I don't know. What do you need? Okay. I'll just write on the board. Okay. Feel free to erase what you have to. Uh, Austin, do me a favor. Don't leave your football stuff outside my room anymore. Is there a place it can go other than just laying on the, con the, co the sidewalk all day? Yeah, that's Yeah, just making sure. Because I, I don't want it to be taken. Yeah. And then have you feel like I'm responsible because I didn't put my uh, watchman out to watch it all day. He got laid off by watchman. I used to have a guy sat up there all day. I know, but Wendell's not exactly very big. Uh, okay. Welcome back. Um, this is about me. Just yeah, one mic, so that you guys can take notes better. Um, so I'm going to continue my lesson with populism. I left off talking about the idea of deflation. Um, can anyone remember what I meant by deflation? What is deflation more money in the economy or less money in the economy? Yeah, it's, it's sort of in the name, but it's still a little bit confusing. So rather than reteach that idea, I thought I'd just show you a little bit of math um, to demonstrate what I mean. <coughs> So I looked up some historical data on the price of corn. So maybe just write down what I'm writing down so that you have an idea of what, what's happening and what it looks like <coughs> mathematically. So 40 cents for a bushel. <coughs> You know what? That's a great question. It's a just a, it, it's a unit of measurement. Is that, that right? Is that weight or is that corn? It's a weighted measurement it, of corn. Oh, okay. It must be a weighted measurement of corn. It was it was the measurement of quantity in the 19th century. Great question, though. No. Yeah, according to this historical data, that is a great question. Um, Forty cents. So from 1880 to 1896, I want you guys to get this down, so just make sure you're following with me. The price of goods, the overall average price of goods, goes down by 23%. So that means a farmer selling a bushel of corn at 40 cents per bushel in 1880 now sells his corn at 31 cents in 1896. Okay, just to be clear on that, the math is 0.4 times 0.23. Okay? That will give you the percentage drop in the price. No, but Okay, you will subtract that and then you subtract that from 40 cents. Okay? The percentage drop, by the way, in case you're interested, 0 0.09. I'm rounding it there. Okay, that's great. You might say, well, everything costs less. What's the big deal? There's less money. Presumably, 30 cents buys you more. But as I said, Farmers were taking on what? What were they taking on? Debt. How are they? Debt. Perfect. Thank you. <coughs> By the way, a bushel is uh, 64 pints. 64 pints of corn. Okay. Everybody close your eyes. I'm so sure. a pint is 16 ounces. So that's two pounds. So you're basically looking at 100 and 
Is that 128 pounds in the bushel? Got it? And for 40 cents, good thing you grew all that corn. 128 pounds of it cost 40 cents. Yeah. You're rolling in money. Anyway, so debt, I want you guys to get this down separately. Debt. This is why it's a big deal, okay? Because while the price of goods went down 23%, the cost of debt, the principle of the debt, the debt principle, right? This one. <coughs> principle, okay, is the amount owed. If you borrow $5, the principle is $5, okay? The principle of the debt stays the same. So you are in trouble, right? The prices are dropping. The principle stays the same. And not only that, I'm a little squeezed on time, but I want, I want to see hands go up right now if, if everybody understands the, the concept of interest. Interest on a on a debt, interest on a loan. Okay, that's okay. I'll show you. So, if you are a farmer and you needed to be loaned fifty dollars, <coughs> and you have an annual payment of two dollars a year, a minimum payment, you have to pay back two dollars a year. Okay. If you had a two percent interest, that means after a year, you owe fifty one dollars. So your debt is going up annually while your prices are dropping, right? So let's say you take that debt out at 1892. Okay, I want you guys to copy this down if you can. I know I'm down low on the board. I'm writing 1892. Um, by, by 1896, your debt, your principal, is now calculated through through something called compound interest, which means you, you multiply by 0.251, and then the next year, the sum of that is multiplied by 0.2 four times. You now owe 55.14, okay? Obviously, these are not today's prices. We could calculate for what's called inflation and find out what this money means in today's language, right? $55 means a lot more money in our language. So before I move on, I just want to establish that <clears throat> prices are dropping, farmers are taking on debt, the principle of the debt remains the same, despite falling prices, and is actually rising every year. Okay, so what's the solution? Just, uh, I'll just throw it out. You guys did $50 there? $50 in today's debt money is $1,385.42. Oh, thank you, that's really so helpful. You can do inflation calculators to find that stuff. Yeah, and that, that's used for things that, that represent, that they needed that loan for tractors, seed, all these things that make farming a little bit more expensive. To take on risk, like we talked about, crop failure, all that stuff. Okay, what's happening? They can't pay this back. Farmers can't pay this back. Write that down. Farmers can't pay debt back. Okay, most are losing their farms to big banks. Okay, because of deflation. This is, this is deflation. This is what we're talking about here. Okay, so the solution, the political movement that arises out of this is called the People's Party. I want you to take that down. Okay, we're going to describe the profile of the People's Party really quick. Okay, they were in the Midwest and the South. They were in the parts of the Midwest and the South that were the most isolated, the most geographically isolated, the furthest from the biggest town in that county. What's the biggest town in Ventura County? 
What's the most rural area in Ventura <coughs> County? The place in Ventura County that when you drive through, you were like, I am in the middle of nowhere. Pyrene. Right? What is it? Pyrene. Say it a lot longer. Pyru. I never even heard of that. So you are in Pyru. You're in the middle of nowhere. There's no train near you. There's no highway near you. There's no road near you. You're growing something. Probably citrus or avocado or something like that. Maybe, right? Is that <coughs> Maybe you're ranching. I don't know. You cannot get your your goods to market. Okay? You are isolated. That is who is in the people's party. People that are isolated, right? Furthest from train stations. Write that down. Okay? Typically small communities. Uh, typically not diverse. I'm just mentioning it just because it just... It just was true, you know. They were um, they were typically uh, economically poor and poor in influence, poor in political influence, right? Um, politicians didn't really care much about what they thought. Their votes didn't matter that much. They came from states that didn't carry a lot of electoral votes. Everybody know what the electoral college is? I hope so. You guys are going to have to Google that on your own. Okay. Okay. The Electoral College. Do we vote? When we vote for president, are we voting directly for president? No. That's what I mean. You guys say that before. Electoral College. Each state has a, a specific number of electoral <laughs> votes based on population, usually the number of representatives and the number of senators. Therefore, the minimum number of electoral votes any state can have is three, right? Represented by two senators and a minimum of one U.S. representative. Okay, now these are the low electoral college votes, okay? Politicians typically don't <coughs> care about these, these places on a national level, right? They can come up with the strategy where they could pick up this, 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 and not really worry too much about Okay, back to the slide. Um, and these people were, were, were um, portrayed in The Wizard of Oz, which is about populism, as, as kind of, what was the scarecrow's problem? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, deeply religious, uh, pr typically Protestant, uh, Presbyterian, or independent. And in the South also, they were black and white. Um, the people who joined the People's Party, it, the people who made it up. So it was, it was diverse in that sense. What it was not diverse in the sense of was new immigration. The cities were centers where new immigration was happening. You had that vocabulary term, new immigrant. These are not communities of new immigrants. Okay, um, next slide. Please. You guys all done with writing this one? Yeah, please take that down. Not new immigrants. Need a little more time on this slide I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry guys. A lot of words. A lot of words. Um, I'll give you guys a minute. Any questions? Um, was there a cave out there that was like trading stuff? Or was it possibly money? Like barter? Yeah. They did. They did. It was their farm. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So yes. And if you play around with the calculations, chances are a farmer's not going to take out fifty dollars to save his farm. What's a more likely, reasonable number? I I, I looked at a few. I thought maybe a thousand dollars. How about ten thousand? Does ten thousand seem like the size of a loan you might take out to try to make your your life? Ten thousand in eighteen ninety two is equivalent to a hundred and uh, 227000 today. So when you think about a bigger loan, I mean, $50 is a loan that you can wrap your head around as a kid. You could imagine borrowing $50, paying it off over a two-year period, so that's 24 months, paying off maybe $2 a month, $2.25. But when you have interest on it, it grows. And what's the point of giving money? Why do I loan somebody money? Yeah, I will do it because I, I don't. First of all, I don't loan money. 
But if I'm a loan shark and I'm wearing a sleek suit, you know, looking like I'm, I'm going to catch on fire if you light a match anywhere near me, it's that type of suit. Uh, if I'm loaning you that money, I'm not doing it because of a, 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 an obligation of feeling good about myself. I'm doing it because I'm going to get paid back, and I'm going to get paid back extra. And if you don't, we're going to break your arm. That's yeah. what loan sharks do. Yeah, you want to make money on that. You want to make money on that. Um, Maybe they're, they're maybe they're taking out from a few banks. Maybe they don't get approved for the big loan. They take out a few small loans. That's really complicated. Their life's a mess. Whatever. By the way, this is a great artist. It's a computer chick. He does this furniture stuff. I, I'll always be using it in my slides. Anyway, so the People's Party comes up with this thing called the Omaha Platform. Does anyone know where Omaha is off the top of their head? Oh, good for you guys. <coughs> Omaha platform, and this is the Omaha platform. Okay, number one, this is an important one. You don't have to write all of these down, but this one is important. It was called the system of sub-treasuries. This is what you need to know about that. Farmers wanted to get paid by the government at 80% of their crop's value in credit that they could pay off debts with. They did not want to be paid by the market. They wanted to be paid by the government. The government would then pay, um, you know, the government would then kind of bring it to market and handle that whole process. Okay. So they're saying, we need, here's the really important part, we need a government guaranteed price <coughs> for crops. A government guaranteed price and payout for crops. So this is meant to minimize risk? This is meant to minimize risk. That's right. That's right. That's right. They didn't want to be swindled at the elevator grain or at the railroad station. They wanted a voucher is what they actually got, a piece of paper that they could bring to a bank and pay off their debts with. They, they could no longer take on all this risk. Yeah. <coughs> would all the banks have that voucher? They would, they, their idea was that they would legally have to. They would legally have to. Yes? And number four, what is the RRs? Oh. Railroads, yeah. Um, abolition of national bank. Let's just let's get to the important ones. Let's not look at that one. Direct election of senators. That was very progressive, and that would happen. Does anybody know how senators were elected at that time? State legislator. Mrs. Belshi knows. Mrs. Belshi knows, guys. Uh, so they wanted government ownership of railroads. This would, this would sort of happen. A lot of this stuff happens eventually. We have Amtrak, right? Sort of happens. Yeah? Why would they want the government to own the railroads? Uh, they wanted to take away the profit motive, oh. right? They're, they're saying to the government, look, you need to get foods to the urban center. We can no longer survive. You need to take care of us. The farmers paid the railroads to yeah. transport their crops, yeah. and the railroads could charge whatever prices they wanted. They were the only game in town. You know I mean? And so there if was the no government owned the railroad, yeah. <laughs> sorry for... No, no, this is perfect. <laughs> this is what she knows. Yeah. The government owned the railroads, then they can vote on people to set the prices, right? You yeah. can't vote on people in the companies to set the prices unless you're a shareholder. <laughs> they were not shareholders in these companies. Most of these companies were privately owned anyway. Why would they, you know, so it was about, they wanted government ownership of railroads and telephone companies and telegraph companies. Most of that had to do with uh, talking to people across other regions. Like if you're in Omaha and you're trying to set prices with somebody in Mobile, Alabama, like, 
if you are in Omaha and you're trying to set prices with somebody here and you need to use a telephone or a telegraph and the railroad company owns that and they're charging you too much to really correspond with each other and make those adjustments in real time so that you guys can all get a fair price. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. This didn't really happen, unfortunately. Not so much. Um, <clears throat> they wanted government operated postal savings banks. Uh, this is something that Bernie Sanders has talked about, actually, and it's it, it has its origins here. Uh, banking at the post office. This was a time when there were a lot of bank runs. Um, so you might, you, you might want to write that down, right? They want a government-operated postal savings banks. You they use could, the term bank run. Does everyone know what a bank run is? A bank run? Has anyone seen It's a Wonderful Life? Christmas time era? Yes? It's always a few? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Herman, a bank run is? A bank run is when all the depositors want to get their money out of the bank at the same time. And guess what? Is the money there? No. Why? They loaned it out. Because they did what with it? They loaned it out. Uh, they loaned it out. What other thing could they do with it that they can't do nowadays? Take it? No. They, they could invest it in the market. They could buy stocks with your money. And they, they can't really do that as much these days. Or they could hold it in reserve with metal. What happened to all the silver? We talked about it last time. What happened to all the silver? Yeah, a lot of those banks had silver, right? So for every dollar you had, they had a pound of silver, right? All of a sudden, silver is no longer money anymore. A lot of that money is not there. People panicked. They tried to get their money out of the bank, and they couldn't. What do you think the government did about that? Absolutely nothing. Uh, they wanted restriction of undesirable immigration. Okay, So this is what I was talking about. This is a weird movement. It's hard to describe a lot of these movements as left or right. A lot of these political parties, I want you to write this down. Political parties in this era are interest groups. They're interested in limited and defined goals that benefit them. They don't have as much mass appeal, right? They don't want undesirable immigration. Okay, they don't want to compete with immigrant farmers from Europe, um, Latin America, Asia, right? They don't want that. So that's in their platform. They wanted an eight-hour work day for government employees. <laughs> pretty progressive. They had some pretty progressive goals. You don't need to write that. Abolition of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Has anybody ever heard of this? You probably saw, saw it in like Deadwood, right? Am I actually on the nose with that? Well, I, I must have read it in a few books, but for example, in the books. Yeah, this was like a private army that big companies could hire out. If, if workers were giving them a hard time, they could just send them in. And they could break strikes. People were striking and not working, and not letting scabs in to work the machines. <coughs> they could come in with guns, and they were just basically just mercenaries. They, they wanted them out. Uh, Australian secret ballot. You used to have to cast your vote publicly. That wasn't very fun. That wasn't very fun. Remonetization of silver. I want you guys to write that down. Remonetization of silver. They wanted their, this is what you need to get, this, what I'm about to say. They wanted their private silver to be worth money again. And they wanted their banks reserve silver to be worth money again. So 
So private silver worth money again. Banks reserve silver worth money again. Anybody have a question? Why do you think they wanted the bank's reserve silver to be worth money again? There are a few reasons. What's that? They had it in the bank. It represented money they lost. What do you think the banks would do if they had more money? Give out more loans. Give out more loans. That's exactly it. Wow. Smart, smart group. Single term president and single term for president and vice president. Probably not a bad idea. That didn't happen. Everybody have this? No. Everybody have the things I told you to write down? Anybody don't have the things I told you to write down? <coughs> Party politics at this time, right? I talked about this. Party loyalties are sectional in this period. That's important. Just write. Party loyalties, sectional. Anybody know what that means? Okay. The North is largely Republican. Right? The North is largely Republican. Party of big business. Also favors government intervention to build infrastructure. So they have that contradiction, right? They, they're very left, and they're also the party of big business. It, it kind of sounds a lot like how we think about, like, a uh, Democratic Party today, right? You think of them like, oh, it, they are sort of, it, they are not as pro-business as our Republican Party, but they're very pro-business, and they also favor government infrastructure projects. So they're similar to that, right? I don't know. So just an analogy, right? It's really hard to do. My point is it's really hard to describe political parties in that left-right way when we look back sure, on it. Back. It's, it gets complicated. It gets more complicated. Um, and they're also, the, they're also popular with evangelicals, including prohibitionists. Prohibitionists. Does everybody remember what prohibition means? Prohibition of what? Alcohol. Alcohol, right? Yeah. So they're popular with that. They're popular with women. I know our friend in the back should know that because he's a Boardwalk Empire fan, right? What political party does Nikki Thompson belong to? Uh, Republican Party, right? Remember? He's in with the prohibitionists and the, the suffragettes. Right. And they're also popular with black voters in the South still. So. Because they're definitely not going to vote Democrat in the South. Um, each party like to, and, and you really need to, to get this down to understand why political parties are sectional. Wave the bloody shirt. Why is the shirt bloody, guys? Whose shirt are they waving? Whose shirt am I waving in the North? Whose bloody shirt am I waving at a political rally? Why is there blood on it? That's a good guess. Their own shirt. They're waving the bloody Union Army uniform. They're saying, never vote Democrat. Those people are traitors. Look at what they did to us. And they're doing the same in the South. They're waving the bloody Confederate shirt and saying, never vote Republican. Don't forget what they did to us. And that is why party loyalties are basically sectional at this time. That's the broadest level of appeal they have. Broadest level of appeal is sectional. Okay. This <coughs> is a political ad. Does anybody? Can anyone read it? Give me a guess. What political party this is? I'll 
I'll read it for you at the top. Protection to free trade. Our home defenders. McKinley. Hobart. What political party do you think that is? There's a factory up there. See the factory in the top left corner? Who has factories in this country at this time? Who's got more factories? No. Right, so what political party is this? No. Yes. So we threw, we're throwing the, the People's Party into the mix there. What's happening in this political cartoon? Yeah, ooh. That's interesting. Why do you think that was? Why do you think they're eating the Democratic Party more than the Republican Party? Maybe because they have factories and they have more. Who has factories? Factories are Republican, remember. What are the Democrats this time? The South. What section of the country are the Democrats in? Go with it, Abby. The South. The South. The South. And what do they have? What are the, what's the economy in the South? They're liberal farmers and but they don't own the farms. Yeah, they're farmers. And what? who are the Republicans in the South? The African-Americans. African-Americans. So there you go. They're farmers too, right? They're sharecroppers, like we talked about. So, so is the distinction you're making that the Democratic Party and Populist Party are both more farming parties? Yes. But the Democrats are the wealthy farmers? The big farmers and the populace are the poorer sharecroppers and less rich farmers. Yes? Black and white, yep. Which is why in 1892, in an election year, fear of the populist party led to 255 lynchings in the South. 155 blacks and 100 whites were lynched by supporters of the Democratic Party. To give you a sense, lynched, the hung, killed. Because they were Democrats, as Mr. Herman said, that the bloody shirt represents this is a blood sport. They actually murdered supporters of the populist party for fear that the populists were going to take away their power. Yeah, this is the this is the emer this is the emergence of what's called the second plan. Second plan. First plan is right after the Civil War. Second clan is kind of the, the clan that gives us Jim Crow laws that you'll learn about or Whatever. Second clan. Okay? They do something called night riding. Night riding is when you go exactly what it sounds like. You get on your horse and you put on your silly costume and you go kill people. That's what it is. Okay, and the economy is really bad. Okay? So to give you an example from, from this textbook, <laughs> during the winter of eighteen eighty nine to night to eighteen ninety, corn prices had fallen so low that some farmers found it cheaper to burn their corn than to sell it and buy fuel to warm their houses. Is everybody clear on what I mean by that? Rather than selling it, they're just going to use it to burn it, to stay warm in the long Nebraska winter. It's, it's, it's going to be too expensive to, to get it to the market and sell it and then buy firewood or coal. So it's easier to burn it. So, <clears throat> the Democratic Party is popular in the South with white voters as well as with immigrants, mostly Catholic immigrants, right? These are the new immigrants from Southern Europe. Uh, and in the North, because they oppose prohibition. Um, Catholics, okay, coming, coming from more alcohol cultures, um, places like Germany, right, beer drinkers, Poles, vodka, beer, Irish, whiskey, Italians, wine, right? These are, these are alcohol drinking countries, not big fans of prohibition. Okay, finally, electoral wins, okay? Big electoral wins. I want you to write this down. Election of 1890. They when pop people's party wins, government, um, sorry, governor's office in Kansas. 
and several state legislators. Why is it important to win state legislators? <coughs> Why is that important? A state legislator is like, it's the Congress that meets just to talk about things that happen in California. What do they do? What's the most important thing a state legislator does? We talked about it. Mrs. Belchie had the answer. Yes? Uh, they determine what the what they vote for in the, the office. Senate. They vote the senators in. Why is that important? Because of the, what's the way we do elections for president? Yeah, electoral college. The electoral college. You get one vote for every senator, and one vote for every representative, basically, right? Okay, um, so they win big in Georgia and Texas, and they send people to Congress. And the People's Party controls 22, I want you to write this down, People's Party controls 22 after, out of 538 electoral college votes, okay? This makes it the most, oh sorry, for the 1892 election. For the 1892 election. That makes it the most popular third party political party in the US to this point. I'm not sure if, it, it, if it's still that way, but there you have it. For any of you guys interested in third party politics, hands up if any of you guys are, are interested in third parties parties that aren't the Democratic or Republican Party. Never been interested in alternative parties. Okay. <coughs> um, that, that's, that's the best they could do. And they nominated candidate James B. Weaver. James B. Weaver. What's the problem with a third party? Why were they telling like Bernie Sanders don't don't run? Like, yeah, of course. Why were they telling Bernie Sanders don't run as a an independent third party candidate? What was it going to do to the Democratic Party? Analogy: What if somebody started a rugby team in the fall? Who would it hurt? Oh, that's a great analogy. Who, Who would it hurt? Yeah. Why do you think the Democrats didn't want Bernie Sanders to run? Who's going to get hurt? They are. they are. Bernie Sanders is going to take voters. Rugby team is going to take football players. <coughs> they need the players. They need the votes. Okay, that's that's the hardest thing about having a third party, right? What's your your more original for you? Yeah. The question is, do you try to take over the party that best represents your interests, or do you try to peel votes away from them? Maybe they lose. Maybe they rethink things. And they say, we need to come to a compromise with this third party and change our party. Just to supplement what Mr. Herman is telling you, this is the 1892 presidential election with the Democrats in blue, the Republicans in red, and the populists in green. You can see that the populists took Idaho, one vote in Oregon, three in Nevada, four in Colorado, ten in Kansas, and a vote in North Dakota. Why do you think they didn't get more in the South? We talked about it before. It has to do with killing people. The reason's killing people. Yeah, because of the, the Klan, the new Klan. Yeah. So that, that was why I told you 255 lynchings in the lead up to this election. This is what that was talking about. Yeah. There's no nice way to put it. That, that's just kind of what politics looks like. That was a, you know, hey, you could get out there and stump and talk on the stump and, and get people excited about your vote. This is how politics was back then. Or you could just go kill people that would vote the other way and terrorize the country. Make people afraid to vote because remember, Mr. Herman told you that the ballot wasn't secret, that your vote could be known. So you had this political organization that people were deadly afraid of. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't last forever, the People's Party. The People's Party doesn't last forever, it falls apart. 
And there are some reasons. Okay, I'm going to start at the bottom here. I want you to write this down. This name is very important. This is a very important politician. Very important politician. William Jennings Bryan. Williams, Jenning, Brian. Williams, Jennings, Jennings. Sorry, Jennings, and that is a typo, and I'm sorry. Okay. William Jennings, Brian is from Omaha, Nebraska. All right. Uh, He's no. Wyoming. <laughs> That's Wyoming. Go over. Oh. Wyoming, Nebraska's yes. below. South Dakota, Above Kansas. Yeah. Uh, you know. that's, that's, that's the Nebraska. Huh? That's Nebraska. Yeah. Okay, there you go. You know, guys, the, Wyoming doesn't look this square. I'm sorry, I drew the map 15 years ago. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a square state, though. It's pressure in them. Um, he is the Democratic Party, but he runs on free silver. He says, we need to monetize silver. Write that down. Monetize. M-O-N-E-T-I-Z-E. -E. Monetize silver, which means make it money again. And he's a Democrat. What do you think that does to the populist vote? They're going to vote for him? Yeah, it peels it away. They actually end up nominating him as their candidate anyway in this election. They say if you're a populist, he's our candidate also. All the votes go to him in either event. Wait, so he gets the Democratic He gets the Democratic nomination and the populist nomination. Kind of weird, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of it for the populist party. They never really recover from, from that blow. Right? And that's what happens with a lot of third party movements. They get absorbed by by the dominant political party. So which which issues did the Democrats address? Well, the Democrats addressed free silver. That was very important. They actually split the vote. Um, there was an independent Democrat running on not free silver. Did not not very important person, but that was a big conflict whether to monetize silver or not. He also ran on a a pro suffragette, pro prohibition platform. He was a strong social conservative, deeply religious person, a appealed to a lot of the same people as would vote for populists. And um, right, so that's one reason for decline. One tip, just to keep the show down. Yeah, we should get a look at the, the William Jenning Bryan person. What you're going to notice is that it was a close election, 5%, but you're also going to notice while a lot of the country looks blue, what a lot of those blue states have in common. Well, they all, all the blue ones voted for William Jennings Bryan, but what do you notice about the work, the population of those states? They're all low numbers. Okay, so while it, you look at this at first glance, if you didn't see the numbers, who would you think won? Blue. You would think blue won, but red has a lot of the big cities. <coughs> Chicago is in Illinois, that's 24 votes. You've got big cities like Cincinnati, Cleveland, and Columbus in Ohio. You've got Gary in Indianapolis in Indiana. You've got Detroit in Michigan, Milwaukee in Wisconsin. You've got Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and Allentown and Wilkes-Barre and Pennsylvania. You've got New York, Rochester, and other places. So you notice that the value of those big states in population are outriding these small states. So, yeah, look at that. Um, another reason was um, <coughs> McKinley was the, the name, you don't need to write this down, but I want you to understand it. McKinley was the Republican candidate. McKinley said, we're going to lift ourselves out of this crash. We had an economic crash that I talked about in 1893. 
similar to like the depression. We're going to lift ourselves out of this with protective tariffs. And we're going to no longer import grain and other foodstuffs from other countries. Instead of monetizing silver again, that's what we're going to do. Protective tariffs. We're not going to import as much from other countries. Who does that sound like today? Say it louder. I heard it from somebody in the back. Who does it sound like? Who's pushing tariffs today? Who's the pro tariff candidate? Or who's one yeah, of them? Say it. Trump. Yeah, Trump. 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 Yeah, yeah. And, and Sanders had a pro tariff platform. So there are echoes of populism in both candidates. And that was his solution. That was McKinley's solution. And that appealed more to urban workers, right? <coughs> and that was because they were manufacturing things and they didn't want to compete with other countries. Okay. Also, why would inflation hurt urban workers? Don't remember the cartoon I drew, the blind corner? On one side you had farmers, on the other side you had urban workers. And they're both kind of trying to better their lives. They want more money for what they do, basically. But on one side, farmers want higher food prices so that they could pay off their debt. Deflation drives the, drives the cost of things down. Urban workers, what do they want? Do they want higher food prices? No. They're not. They, Urban workers don't run businesses. Farms are businesses. Farm owners are business owners. They take on debt. They are their company. Urban workers are workers. They are laborers. They are not business owners. They want lower food prices. They do not take on debt. So they can't really coincide and create this really popular party, right? This lower class party, kind of something that you would think as like a really broad appeal social movement, an economic socialist type movement, right? They can't do it because they disagree about food prices. And it was a real disagreement, you know? It was, a rea it was real. It seems weird to us at this time. We live in a different era, but it was an anxiety and it worked against them. Also, we have another thing happening. Deflationary spiral goes down. Yukon Gold Rush. Right? Here's Jack London. Everybody know who Jack London is? Probably not. Wrote White Fang. It's the first book I ever read. White Fang. Okay. So what were his stories he was like? a novelist uh, writing at this time, and he, he did like adventure kind of things, you know. Wrote like adventure kind of stories. Um, he wrote a book about the, the Gold Rush, Tales of the Gold Rush. The Yukon. Anyone know where the Yukon is? What's that? Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's Alaska, and it's also part of Canada. It's a it's a province in Canada, which is like a state, and also in Alaska. This brings a lot of money into our economy, just like the Gold Rush did. So it backs, our, it backs the total number of money that we have in our economy. We still have an open mint. You can still exchange gold for paper money, or have it minted and pressed into coins. We can give that to bank. They can, we can, they can create loans. It creates inflation. Food prices rise, right? It's a weird thing. It comes out of, it comes out of nowhere, right? And sometimes that's what happens. This is not a political thing. This just comes out of left field and changes everything. It's a historical moment that disrupts this social change that's <coughs> happening. Okay? Um, and then, of course, you have the, Dem the Democratic elite violently suppressed the vote, night riding, KKK. Right? Reconstruction's over. Next slide. Okay, so finally, I told you I'd circle back to the good old um, Wizard of Oz, which is, yeah? Do you want us to write this down? No, do not write this down. We're going to read this. I will read this. This is, um, 
William Jennings Bryan. Okay, but I want to talk about the yellow brick road. The yellow brick road is made out of. Her shoes are red here, but in in the in the actual book is a book. Silver, silver, silver. <coughs> uh, the scarecrow is the farmer. The farmer. Yeah. Very good. Um, the Tin Man, who's also called the Woodsman. Who do you think he is? It's called an allegory. So everybody is symbolic. Everybody represents a lot of people. The factory guy. I heard somebody say factory guy. That is that is close enough. He's a factory guy. He's an urban worker. He's a miner. I don't know. He's he's a potential boat there. Um, uh, the wicked wizard, wicked wist, the wicked witch of the West is Republican candidate William McKinley, who I talked about. Um, Oz, 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 O, Z. What is that an abbreviation for? Think of science, Oz. Ounce. That's right. It's an abbreviation for a measurement. Ounce. The Wizard of Oz, the Wizard of Ounces. Uh, Dorothy. That's kind of easy. Who's Dorothy? Represent. She's the main character. Dorothy. Who does she represent? Uh, somebody bringing in silver. Maybe yeah, that's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this textbook says traditional American values. She's like a potential voter, right? What's the whirlwind? What's the tornado? It's good. I like all these answers. Um, it's hard to say. That's kind of a vague one. Some people say it's the populist movement itself. It's sweeping her up and bringing her to this place. Um, uh, Toto is a prohibitionist party, also called teetotalers, people who drink tea. Toto's the dog. Um, Cowardly Lion is Williams, William Jennings Bryan. He is the Cowardly Lion. Okay, he has, he's known for his oratory, his speaking skills, but he doesn't really actually end up following through on them, it turns out. Years later, he becomes Secretary of State. He doesn't really follow through on this platform. But when he was nominated in 1896, he gave this speech. It's kind of famous. It's called the Cross of Gold speech. And I'll just read it for you. Okay, this is what got him the nomination at 36, the youngest candidate in US history. I'm 31. Mr. Buck was 131. I'm 40. That puts him halfway between us. Yes. <laughs> Bad joke. The following. Um, so William Denny Bryan gives a speech. You have to be 35 to run for president. He's a year older than you can legally be. You have to be at least 35. He's 36. And he says, on the no at the convention, when they're nominating a candidate, right? he gives a speech, if they dare come out in the open field and defend the gold standard as a good thing, we will defight them to the uttermost, having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, and the toilers everywhere. We will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down on the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Are we still on the gold standard? No. Nope. Went off of it in 1970. Thanks, Nixon. Ended up being a good thing. One of the few good things Nixon did. This is Belchi. You want to be on the gold standard still? Guys, Mrs. Belchi is pro gold standard. <coughs> she told me. 
<laughs> she wants the gold standard back. She's got gold. Um, I it in my basement. Yep. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks. All right. So, um, populism. Um, spent a good chunk on that, and here, here's the part to put it into a bigger context as well. There are one of the groups under this umbrella. Yes. Here's.